Hey everyone, we're here at the Paris Air Show on the deck of the GE Aerospace Chalet. You all sent in a few thoughtful questions and so I caught up with our chief engineer, Chris Lawrence here, so that we could divide and conquer the questions for you. Terrific. Chris, want to intro yourself? Absolutely. Thanks, Alicia. So I'm, I'm Chris Lawrence. I've been the chief engineer for a few years now. I've been with GE for 28 years. You're probably not even that old, uh, but uh, <laughs> Close. anyway, it's a long time. Um, and so I cover a number of things, including safety and airworthiness, um, and a, a lot of things about how we make sure our engines work the way we want them to. Um, so proud to be part of the engineering team like Alicia, and so looking forward to answering some of your questions. Awesome. All right, well, let's jump right in, Chris. The first question that we received is, what technology advancements are you most surprised by in your career? So that's a great question. You know, there, there, we've had a lot of great advancements over the years in, in jet engines. One of the ones that I'm most excited about is watching how fan blades have changed over time. You know, before I joined the industry, you know, we had titanium fan blades that had um, part span shrouds, tip shrouds on them, and a lot of blades around. When you look at the front of the engine, what you see that's changed the most over the last few decades is how we've gone to composite fan blades you know, starting with the G90, which had 22 blades, right? Wide cord, no shrouds. We've advanced those through the GNX, through the Leap engine, and now the G9X engine, which Alicia, you work on now. Quiz for you. Yeah. How many fan blades on the G9X fan? 16. 16, <laughs> well done. So, I mean, going from what were dozens of fan blades before to these giant wide cord meat cleavers, that's been just a fantastic technology advancement that I've seen over the years. Definitely. I have to totally agree with that, Chris. Okay. So, so Alicia, for you, one of the questions that come up is how many hours are jet engines tested before they're certified? Now, you actually work <laughs> in tests, yeah. so you're like the perfect person to answer this question. <laughs> yeah, so it really depends, Chris. Um, it really depends on what type of test mission we'll be supporting at that time. So thankfully our test organization is able to offer a number of different services. Uh, we have everything from dust endurance testing that takes place all the way through to hill storm, monsoon level rain, as well as um, even a few ingestion testing. So it really depends on the amount of hours based off of what the mission is we're trying to complete whether it be trying to see how long our hardware components are able to withstand or the amount of temperature, climate, weather conditions uh, they would be able to hold up against. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a long battery test. We do indoor, we do outdoor, we, we inject with hail, water, all sorts of different things, birds, um, and, and really ring the engines as much as we can to make sure that they're going to be tested well beyond anything they're going to see in service. So it, it's, a, it's a great test campaign, but I have to ask, what is your favorite test of all the tests that we do for <laughs> certification? Which one is your favorite? I would have to say the dust endurance testing that we do, only because it may be one of the coolest. We have a special dust composition that we create internally, and it's just very cool to see the dust set up as well as you know the impact that it actually has on some of our hardware mm -hmm. components. And you get like a swag bag of dust that you can carry around with you and say, hey, I got all the dust that goes in the engine? I actually do have a little valve dust that sits on my desk every day. That's awesome. <laughs> so the dust engine testing, this is really something we've just developed in the last several years, really to ensure that the conditions that we test in the factory match what we see in the field, what the customers actually see, particularly in challenging environments like in the Middle East and India. So the dust endurance testing has been a great addition to our test portfolio that at least the team will work on. Definitely. All right, let's head to our next question. Is GE Aerospace exploring completely the electric propulsion? Yes, we are. So we're, we look at all kinds of propulsion. You know, we, we study all electric, we study hybrid electric, and we study sort of conventional propulsion and really looking to see where the industry is going to go. It's a little bit too early to tell what's going to come out over the next several years, but we're really at an inflection point of technology where the electric engines actually have enough capability where you're starting to see more urban air mobility, eVTOL, other kinds of aircraft that are fully electric powered. And so we're still deciding where we want to participate in that part of the bit, in part of the business, but we're certainly studying the technologies. We have a few great programs we're doing around hybrid electric, 
where we combine conventional gas turbines with uh, all electric. We're doing one with NASA called EPFD, which is where we, we're going to have a conventional gas turbine engine. We're going to have an um, a electric powered uh, motor. We're going to run a megawatt powertrain. We're going to fly that in the middle of the decade. We have another one here in Europe that we're doing called the AMBER program, where we're going to use a hydrogen fuel cell to, to look at how we, we move power around. And we're also working a program with um, Sikorsky called the HEX program, looking at how we apply hybrid electric to, uh, to uh, helicopter engines. So there's a lot of opportunity, we think, when you look at um, different kinds of electric and hybrid electric propulsion over the, over the coming years. That sounds cool. And it gets me excited about our ability to really shape the future of flight here. Right. So one of the other questions we got was, what majors did you study? What, would, what should someone study if they want to be an aerospace engineer? So what did you study? Yeah, so for me, um, I studied industrial engineering as well as I went on to study engineering management. Now both of those are really important for how I support the business because they really taught me the fundamentals on how to critically think, how to problem solve, project management skills and tools that would help me to be effective in whatever part of the business that I chose to enter. But they're extremely, extremely important in my ability to support our engineering mm -hmm. division because it allows me to really think through some of the challenges that we face and how to effectively problem solve. Great. What was your favorite class? Um, it may be a simulations class that I had. Okay. And that's only because you get to take something from a concept and actually simulate it, figure out how it's going to look before it actually gets into it, like, the reality of it. That's great. So I am a, my degree is actually in mechanical engineering. Uh, I went to Duke University. I have a uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD in, uh, in mechanical engineering. My graduate work was in unsteady aerodynamics. So I really, because Duke didn't have an aerospace major, I, I studied mechanical, but most of my work has been in aerodynamics. And so that's, we take people who have mechanical engineering backgrounds, industrial engineering, aerospace, electrical, material science, a wide range of degrees because we work on a pretty broad range of technologies, um, not just designing hardware that go into engines. Exactly. I'd have to agree. As long as you're coming in and you're willing to learn from those around you and you are willing to provide your input, I think GE Aerospace is a great place for you to be. All right. Moving into our next question. So, what are CMCs and why are they important for jet engine technology? So CMCs stand for Ceramic Matrix Composites. And so they, they have a great ability where they have the, tech, the thermal capability that ceramics, think about it like a coffee cup, but they're much more durable. So with a coffee cup, if you were to smash it on the table, you'd break it. With a CMC, you can beat that thing pretty hard. You are not going to beat up a CMC. And so they have great, um, they're reduced weight compared to metal. They don't require as much cooling and they last longer. So we've been developing CMCs for about 20 years and we have our first application here on the LEAP engine. You can see the CFM chalet behind me that, that has the LEAP engine with the CMC shroud over the H high pressure turbine. And then on the Dynex, we have multiple CMC parts. Alicia, how many CMC parts do we have on the 9X engine? I think that's a total of five. What are they? <laughs> Extra credit. <No. laughs> Now you're really testing me there, Chris. Maybe you can help me out. <laughs> the combustor liner, the stage one uh, nozzle, the stage two nozzle, the um, stage one shroud, and the other liner in the combustor. So, well done. Thank you. Great, important part of the engine. <laughs> Teamwork. Mixed Teamwork, <laughs> absolutely. So, so, just to go along with that, so why is bypass ratio important? So I love this question, um, mainly because working with large commercial engines is giving me, you know, a good feel for the significance and the benefit that we get from a high bypass ratio. So you want your high, uh, you want your bypass ratio to be as high as possible because ultimately it impacts our fuel efficiency. So right now, uh, Chris mentioned on the GE9X, we have an 134 inch fan. This means that we're able to really get some maximum airflow there coming in. And all of that airflow allows us to improve um, our capabilities and it allows us to reduce the drag. So by reducing the drag and improving the overall propulsive efficiency, we're able to you know, increase that high bypass ratio and you know, somewhat increase the fuel efficiency overall for the entire mm -hmm. engine. 
That's absolutely right. And, and also leads into one of the things we're talking about a lot here at the show, and we actually have a half-size model down uh, on the ground floor of the chalet, is our new Rise engine, which has a fan diameter that's just about 134 inches in diameter, but for a narrow body class engine. So it doesn't have the um, traditional nacelle and thrust reverser that our uh, traditional engines have had, but this open fan really allows you to increase the propulsive efficiency and to get to even higher bypass ratios than what we see on the G9X and LEAP and our current generation of, it, of engines. That's, that's great. All right, folks. So those are some of your questions. We thank you for joining in with us, tuning in right here from the Paris Air Show. Chris, thank you for your time. Thanks. Great to be here. Right. See y'all. See ya. <laughs>